you might think that this book was chosen by me because it so aligns with the, the, the philosophy that I talk about all the time, but it wasn't. It was actually recommended to me by some of our staff. And, and I, I've known about John, John Gottman for years. John, John Gottman, excuse me, is a researcher who looks at couples and family relationships and, and does some really comprehensive research to look at what works and, and what's going to predict success in various relationships. And he's very thorough in the process. And, the, and he has a laboratory and an institute that people come to to, to both be tested and to, and to learn about ways to be in relationships. So How to Raise an Emotionally Intelligent Child is the name of the book that I'll be talking about tonight. And again, I'll talk about the, the, the concepts that Dr. Gottman talks about. I'll, I'll re relate them a little bit to what I talk about all the time so you can see kind of the, the shared principles that, that, uh, that come beneath the various languages, the, the language that he uses versus the language that I use. In the end, I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of, of this book and, and in his approach to the parent-child relationship. So I, I constantly hear about how times have changed so dramatically. And, and a lot of times I try to minimize that and I say, well, they, they definitely have changed, but, but on the surface um, only. And that beneath the surface that we have similar challenges. And what Dr. Gottman points out in his book is that fundamentally some of the outcomes and some of the, the negative outcomes have changed in the past 30 or 40 years. Homicides for adolescents have increased four times. Suicides have increased three times. Forcible rapes have, have doubled. And that assessments of our children today reveal, in many cases, lower level of functioning. There's a lot of stress, a lot of exposure uh, to, to young people today. That is does seem to be unique if we are to look at the increasing rates of these, these horrible outcomes, of course. I talked last week about internet, computer, and social media and its impact, the, the immediacy, the, the ability to, to, to bully or be bullied, uh, the comparisons that happen, right? That the child's circle has expanded dramatic, dramatically, right? So that, that, that kind of influence is, is less controlled than it used to be. Less natural lessons. The average family works a thousand more hours than they did over a decade ago. A thousand more hours a year. That's tremendous. And increasing anxiety for parents due to these challenges, of course, has happened. You know, we talk often in the media, we talk about this in our country a lot about how when we grew up, we could just go outside and play. But because of all of these risks that are out there, that parents are, are much more controlling of their child's environment and, and interactions because of the dangers and the risks that are out there. So I thought it'd be, I thought it would be fair to, to, to share that. I, I love the starting point of his book. And I was happy to see this. Dr. Gottman says the path to becoming a better parent, like most every road to personal growth and mastery begins with self-examination. I, I talk about this. I think about it every day. I was thinking about it today in the context of some supervision from, with some therapists who aren't even a voc therapist. And this idea that if people can do more work, people can do work, can have the courage to look at themselves, they can build a foundation where they can explore every other aspect of, of mental health and psychology. In fact, one of the weaknesses that I'll point out with Dr. Gottman is that most of what he shares, although he shares some personal anecdotes, but most of what he shares principally, and he thinks of this as a strength, is from the research and the observations that he makes. But what doesn't come through in his work is a, a deep understanding of the terrain of one's individual psyche. Right? That's not his approach. That's not what he does. But, but he knows enough of that, that it, it starts with an understanding of self. Surprisingly, he says, much of today's popular advice to parents ignores the world of emotion. Instead, it relies on child-rearing theories that address children's misbehavior, but disregard the feelings that underlie that misbehavior. Again, I, I loved seeing this point because it was a foundational piece in the early part of his book about the fact that, that when we pay attention to behavior, we miss the child altogether. In fact, problematic behavior is in part in place 
to distract us from exploring the emotional world. In other words, it does a good job of distracting the person from the pain, but it also gets the people around the person who's misbehaving to focus on the behavior rather than the more authentic and deep and difficult emotional process. Like I've quoted before, Carl Jung said that neurosis, neurotic behavior, is a substitute form of legitimate suffering, that our, our symptoms serve to distract us and others from a more authentic experience of feeling. So Dr. Gottman talks about throughout the book about that, that what really comes, what really speaks to, in his research, to the development of resilient children, of emotionally intelligent children, is an exploration of their emotional world. He describes emotional intelligence for the parents as being aware of your child's feelings. Can you mentalize? Can you imagine? I talk about this all the time. It's okay to be confused by your children's behavior. Like I said, it's in part in place to confuse you. But it is your job, as I see, to come to understand your child. And if we sim simply dismiss the child and their world by saying things like, well, they're just a child or they're just crazy or they're being irrational or being crazy. If we simply dismiss it in those ways, we really don't do this, this deeper piece of understanding what it's like to be them in their shoe. Can we develop that capacity? Being able to soothe the child is, is part of a parent's emotional intelligence. And I'll talk about that in various ways. But being able to offer comfort not in the short term, not make it go away, but real authentic comfort that can help the child learn to soothe themselves and can help the child feel and move through their emotions, to learn to empathize. You know, when I think about myself as a, a man in the world, because of my practice as a therapist, one of the things that I'm aware of that's happened to me over, over the past two and a half decades is my ability to, to really see and understand people that, that many years ago I couldn't see and understand. And I suspect the same is true with you. Right? As you have been invited and, and been willing to go into this process with your child, you have the ability to see parents, to see children and their struggles with more clarity. You develop new eyes and new ears to see and hear better. Conversely, I, I talk about this, I said this to my therapist just the other day, that oftentimes socially somebody will tell me, the seemingly most crazy thing. And I find a way to say, genuinely, I can see where you're coming from. That makes sense in some way to me. And yet at the same time, I might share socially that I don't like Brussels sprouts, for example. Or that my favorite color is, is green instead of blue, whatever it is. Something very trivial where people have a difficult time allowing me to feel that way, right? Seeing the world through my eyes and, and, and through my perspective. So I become aware of that. I became aware of bandwidth. So being able to empathize, to put yourself in other shoes, being able to recognize when people don't empathize with you is an extension of that. And then, of course, to provide guidance, to find moments to provide training and teaching to help children problem solve and to help children deal with difficult emotions. Now. I'm going to put an asterisk by that because most parents go to that too quickly. Gottman purposefully lists it last. And, and when he talks about the steps of what he calls uh, emotional coaching, he talks about being kind of the last in the steps. But it can easily be something that we go to too quickly and can sound like, look like, and be dismissive of the child. For children, emotional intelligence he defines as being able to control impulses, right? not being really the, the, the subject to every whim and developing that over time. Being able, willing, capable of delaying gratification. Being able to self-motivate. Being able to read, respond, be sensitive to social cues, but, but not overwhelmed by them. And then, of course, coping with life's challenges. That's a broad umbrella, of course. Dr. Gottman says that emotional coaches, they don't object to their children's displays of anger, sadness, or fear. 
nor do they ignore them. Instead, they accept negative emotions as a fact of life, and they use emotional moments as opportunities for teaching their kids important life lessons and building closer relationships with them. This might seem simple to those of you that, that have been in, at this a little bit longer, but it is foreign, if you don't remember, it is foreign for a lot of parents initially in this process. I take a little issue with him calling them, and he does throughout the book, negative versus positive emotions. He might even, he might even qualify that, I can't remember. But I, I would say the, the painful emotions, the uncomfortable emotions. I, I have a colleague who some evangelical, somebody was proselyting at their door, knocked on their door and, and asked them, do they want to learn how to be happy? And my colleague responded by saying, I want to learn how to feel all of my emotions. And of course, he, he, was, he was being playful with the idea that really being healthy is to understand and feel all the emotions. But in order to feel comfortable doing that, for the most part, we have to grow up or we have to have exposure to somebody who welcomes all of our feelings. And then learns to distinguish between feelings and behaviors. And that can be difficult. He describes what, what is not emotional coaching. Gottman does. He describes dismissive parents. And he says those are those, they are those who disregard, ignore, or trivialize parents' children's negative emotions. I, I thought it was profound in, in one piece where he said a lot of people who are dismissive, and I find this to be true also in my work with parents, a lot of people that would be, would be described as, as dismissive by researchers, by, by their observations of these parents, would not would be surprised to learn that they were dismissive because oftentimes, again, on the surface, it doesn't look harmful or, or cruel. It's things like, look on the bright side, or I'm sure she didn't mean it, or your teacher must have had a good reason, or if you just don't think about this, it'll go away, or you have nothing to be afraid of. Those all on the surface don't sound harmful. But we learn as we work in this process, as we learn deep listening, all of us, we learn that that kind of language feels very dismissive. And even though the child might not be conscious of it, they learn that, it, that there are good feelings and bad feelings, feelings that are allowed and safe to express and, and those that aren't. Disapproving parents, he says, those are, they are those who are critical of their children's displays of negative feelings and may, rep, may reprimand or punish them for emotional expression. So he says they're kind of like dismissive parents, only with more judgment and intensity. And then lastly, he talks about laissez-faire parents who accept their children's emotions and empathize with them, but fail to offer guidance or set limits on their children's behavior. So let's talk about what emotional coaching is. This is what he calls it. It was a very, I'd never read the book before uh, planning for this broadcast, but it was surprising that that's what he decided to call it, emotional coaching. I would call it healthy attachment. But he said emotional coaching, steps in emotional coaching include these, becoming aware of the child's emotion, being able to identify it, first of all. Some parents don't even, it doesn't even enter their field. They're so focused on behaviors. Recognizing the emotion, number two, recognizing the emotion as an opportunity for intimacy. Parents that, that are emotional coaches, that practice emotional coaching, look at difficult emotions, feelings, that a child is going through as an opportunity for intimacy and connection. Three, listen emp empathetically, validating the child's feelings. This is something we talk about all the time. This is something that every treatment model talks about all the time. Learning to understand, listen, and validate. Number four, help the child find words to label the emotion he is having. So helping them to express it, helping them to find the words, giving them multiple choice, reflecting back using a moderate interpretation and checking out with the child and seeing if you get it correct, if you get it correctly. And then the more you do it, the more accurate you're going to be in, in reflecting back. And then finally, step number five, set limits where exploring strategies to solve the problem at hand while, ex excuse me, while exploring strategies. 
limits and, and, and teaching opportunities. Again, be careful because most parents go to this too quickly. I have yet. I will say this, while it might not be 100%, it's in the high 90s. I have yet to work with a parent who is not at least adequate, if not good, at problem solving for their child, right? Offering solutions to the child. So that's not missing. Gottman lists it last because after that groundwork is laid, there's an opportunity to explore. Notice he sets, he talks about setting limits while exploring. It's not giving them the answers, giving them advice. It's saying, here's what you can and cannot do in our home. Right? in this relationship, and what are some options, and, and really pulling it out from the child. So pack away lectures, pack away advice giving, pack away simple solutions, and, and explore it with them. Gottman says, many well-meaning parents dismiss children's fears and upsets as though they didn't matter. There's nothing to be afraid of, you tell the five-year-old who wakes up crying from a nightmare. Then obviously you didn't see what I saw. Might be an appropriate reply. The child in such situations begins to accept the adult's estimation of the event and learns to doubt her own judgment. With adults constantly invalidating her feelings, she loses confidence in herself. Thus, we have inherited a tradition of discounting children's feelings simply because children are smaller, less rational, and less experienced, and less powerful than the adults around them. This is important. Taking children's emotions seriously requires empathy keen listening skills and a willingness to see things from their perspective. If your feelings are dismissed, if your feelings are unwelcomed as a child, if there is no safe place to express your irrational childlike experience, you will grow up not knowing your truth, not knowing what is right for you, doubting yourself, you'll grow up with a, a vulnerability or a susceptibility to peer pressure, to, to problematic or negative relationships. So like we talk about all the time, and his research bears it out, this is what makes a difference, being able to see and hear children. The effects he describes on emotional coaching, fewer negative feelings and more positive feelings. Again, I take issue with negative versus positive, but I, I think I know what he's referring to. Well, I think we all know what he's referring to. More resiliency. He describes it specifically as a buffer against the effects of the divorce. And I would say against other traumatic experiences. My own dissertation was about how looking at childhood traumas was mitigated when the child identified that at least one consistent person saw them, heard them, was there for them. Number four, studies indicate that a father's going to be much more extreme. There's a whole chapter on this in his book, whether that effect is good or bad. A father's capacity, and he says it's not to, to downplay and minimize the mother's, but, but the research tends to show that a father's ability to, to emotionally coach has a more profound impact on the child, either positive or negative. Number five, and because you have an emotional bond with your children, your words matter. They care about what you think, and they don't want to displease you. I put an asterisk by that because I talk about this, and those of you who have listened to these broadcasts all the time, that's not ideal, right? We don't want our children to, to think that it's their job to please us. So, well, and, and this go, his, his opinion of this goes in line with, I think, a lot of lay people's. But we know from treatment, we know from child development, we know from addiction and recovery research, we know from motivational interviewing, that is the, the, the model that talks about how to uh, facilitate change in a client. We know that caring about being weighted down with what others think of you, starting with your parents, is not an effective long-term fuel for change, for healthy change. I think what he's talking about is there's a sensitivity, a connectedness, right? An awareness. But the way that he, that I, I took issue a, a little bit with the way that he spelled it out here. A reduction in antisocial behaviors, and he listed a bunch. The research shows that 
parents who exhibit emotional, emo, excuse me, emotional coaching, their children tend to have less antisocial behaviors, less health-related effects, negative health-related effects if the parent practices emotional coaching, and lower stress hormones in the blood. More flexible, the child is able to deal with stress. The child is able to deal with change easier and transitions easier. So let's go th through his four types of parenting. And all of us have some parts of some of these, especially with this first one. I think we can all relate to it sometimes. Let's talk about dismissive parenting, the dismissive parent. The dismissive parent treats child's feelings as unimportant or trivial, right? One parent said in his book, well, my, that's not an adult feeling. That's a child's feeling, and they're not rational. Disengages from or ignores the child's feeling. Non-responsive. Doesn't think they're important. Whereas to the child, they're, they're, they're enormous. Wants the child's negative emotions to disappear quickly. I imagine most of us can relate to that to some degree. And we try to do things like distract them from it, right? Give them something that'll make them feel good, talk them out of it. All those look on the bright side, little phrases that I described earlier. Characteristically uses distraction to shut down the child's emotions. Right, what I was just talking about. May ridicule or make light of the child's emotions. Sometimes they do this overtly. Sometimes they do this in their mind. Sometimes they did this in discussing the child's emotions with the research. Believes the child's feelings Children's feelings are irrational and therefore don't count. To, to some extent, almost all emotions have an element of, of irrationality in them. Right? They're, they're, they're by definition not rational. They can make sense, but they're not a rational experience. So it's something we do when we lack the capacity to hold, to contain, to sit with, to allow a, a child to feel. We, we, we tell ourselves things like this to justify our intolerance of their uncomfortable feeling. The dismissing parent shows little interest in what the child is trying to communicate. They're there, it's okay, don't worry about it. They may lack awareness of emotions in self or others, right? In a lot of ways, especially with this category of dismissive parenting, it doesn't come from, from, a, from a dark or, or evil or bad place of parent. It becomes because of a lack of recognition. It becomes because they believe that they're there to shield their child from pain and, and negative emotions. So it's not necessarily a, a moral failing. It's just an unawareness of the dynamics of, of human behavior and of human relationships. The dismissive parent feels uncomfortable, anxious, annoyed, hurt, or overwhelmed by the child's emotions. I see that a lot in the parents that I work with, at least initially. Right? It's, it's, it's hard. Nobody can tame them. They don't know how to contain the child. They become overwhelmed with the child's feelings. You know, the, the problem with a child's feelings is that we see what they feel. Let's say it's rage or anger at mother, father, brother, sister. Just start there. We fear that that's going to lead to negative choices and decisions because they've made negative choices and, and decisions. And so we try to co control the feeling. So our work, right, the work that we talk about is to learn to embrace and, and, and welcome and validate the feeling while holding limits and boundaries on the behavior and to separate the two very distinctly. And then ultimately, sometimes we feel like if, a child is just allowed to feel it's like watering weeds or it's going to get out of control or it's never going to be resolved. It's never going to be okay. That's a very common thing that I hear adults tell me. The dismissing parent focuses more on how to get over the emotions than on the meaning of the emotion itself. The dismissive parent believes negative emotions are harmful or toxic, right? That sadness, anger, fear, is inherently negative or toxic. Believing the dismissive parents believe 
at least focusing on negative emotions will just make matters worse. Like I said, just watering it. They feel uncertain about what to do with the child's emotions. That's part of that overwhelm thing. I don't know what, I don't know. See, we just don't have models that, that what people need is to be sat with, understood and seen. You have it now, especially because you've all been through this. You've seen your children struggle. You've been kind of forced by these circumstances to get into therapy, to get into Al-Anon or Codependence Anonymous. And so you've learned the magic of sitting with somebody in pain and just letting them not be alone in that feeling. Sees the child's emotions as a demand to fix things, right? They can't hear. I, I found this in my life. It's hard for me to hear an upset emotion from somebody in my family, somebody that I care about, let alone somebody that I might meet professionally. It's hard for me to hear an emotion without hearing a request to fix something. My wife and I talk about this all the time when we're sharing, when we're sharing upset feelings about something. We have to remind each other, I didn't ask you to fix it. I don't need you to say anything, all right? It's, it's almost instinctual for us. Dismissive parents think that the child's negative emotions reflect badly on the parent, right? Versus thinking it, it's, it's about my child. It, it gives me some window into their internal world. There's a quote from Banksy, the, the graffiti artist, the famous artist. And he said, many parents are willing to do almost anything for their children, except for allowing their children to be themselves. Right? It takes a great amount of ego strength to allow your child to be upset with you, to be upset with circumstances. I skipped one here on the slide. Believes negative emotions mean the child is not well adjusted. Right? I remember I walked up to a transition ceremony with grandparents and a child, and the grandmother met me at my vehicle and said, it's not going well, it's really falling apart. I, I came to find out that the child was just expressing assertively and clearly some anxiety about the next step. And when I fished around for examples of manipulation or, or, or inappropriate, aggressive communication, I found none. Nobody, nobody shared any, even grandmother and grandfather. And I looked at grandmother and I said, this isn't something that has to be fixed. Any of us would feel some anxiety in going to a new setting, right? This is why it's so hard for so many of the parents that I work with to go into 12-step meetings and other such meetings. The dismissive parent believes, or excuse me, minimizes the child's feelings, downplaying the events that led to the emotion. It's a classic way to dismiss. It wasn't that bad. He didn't mean it. He's just, it's just, they're just being je jealous. The dismissive parent does not problem solve with the child. Believes that the passage of time will resolve most problems. What are the effects of, of, of having a dismissive parenting style on children? Well, first they learn that their feelings are wrong, inappropriate, not valid. I, I mean, it's, it's almost too obvious to say this, but doesn't that seem, doesn't that make so much sense? And don't we see how, how fundamentally at risk that puts a human being to not know or trust their feelings? Think about the vulnerability that places young people in relationships with, with partners, with, with friends, with their peer group. Next, they may learn that there's something inherently wrong with them because of what they feel. I think one of the, the, the biggest awarenesses I've had as an adult, because I was one of the children in our program. I was just like them and had similar profiles, similar difficulties, academic problems, family problems, sent away to treatment and so forth, is I've come to realize that the feelings that I had, the anger that I had, at what was going on in our family was right on. It was valid. I was right. And knowing that now as a therapist for families and young people, I spend a lot of my time helping parents to see 
their children and helping parents with love and compassion develop enough strength to understand that they're human too. And that growing up in any of our homes would, would come with great difficulty at times. No matter how much we love our children, no matter how much we, we, we treasure the, the, the wonderful intent of our hearts to help children to be happy and to grow. The dismissive parent may have difficulty regulating their own emotions, right? Anxiety, frustration, disappointment. The next level, there's a lot of overlap here, he says, but the next level or next category, he didn't call a level, I did, is the disapproving parent. The disapproving parent displays many of the dismissing parent's behaviors, but in a more negative way. Judges and criticizes the child's emotional expression. When it's particularly difficult for me, that's what I do with, with family members and loved ones. I tell them why their feeling is stupid or bad or ridiculous. It comes with a, a flavor of disdain. Lucky for me, lucky for them, my family is good at pointing it out when I do it. The disapproving parent is over aware of the need to set limits on their children. That becomes the focus, the emphasis, right? At the cost of becoming curious and fascinated by the child's internal workings, world, and emotions. The disapproving parent emphasizes conformity to good standards of behavior. Right? It becomes a lack of balance, the primary focus, instead of seeing behavior as a symptom of unresolved, unworked through emotions. The disapproving parent reprimands, disciplines, or punishes the child for emotional expression, whether the child is misbehaving or not. That's phenomenal, and I've seen this. You know, sometimes children will come and say, I got in trouble for my anger. And sometimes what they mean is, I got in trouble for putting a hole in the wall with my fist. Right? And I, I help them understand that that's not a feeling, that is a behavior. But I have seen, I have watched, I've heard, I've done it. Where children get in trouble, live for feeling something. My daughter, who's now 10, this is probably five years ago or so. She was with a friend, and this was, this was told to us by the parent that was driving the car. My daughter said to that other parent, she said, my mommy is nicer because I'm allowed to feel sad when I feel sad because her daughter was getting in trouble for, for crying and being upset. And I thought, what a great gift that, that my wife gave to her daughter to allow her to feel sad when she's sad. Reprimands, disciplines, oh, excuse me, I already said that. Believes expression of negative emotions should be time limited. You know, when are you going to get over it? Well, when you get over it. They become impatient. When is this stuff going to end? Enough is enough. Healing comes on, on the time frame of the person who's been hurt, not on others. The disapproving parent believes negative emotions need to be controlled. The negative emotions reflect bad character traits. Believes the child uses negative emotions to manipulate. This belief results in a power struggle um, that, that they, they think that it makes people weak. Children must be emotional, tough for survival. I, I've seen this a lot. And I, I will tell you that I'm not always great at telling the difference between when somebody's trying to manipulate me or when somebody's just expressing upset toward me or about me. I'm pretty good at it with my clients because I respond as if it's all something that's about them. But with my family, it's more difficult. But really, that's where... When a child or, or a loved one tells us they're upset, it's really essentially the same response. It's sensitivity, compassion, empathy, understanding. So if we act as if they're not trying to manipulate us, which is what I do as a professional that I struggle to do in my own home, if we act as if they're trying to not manipulate us, it actually, over time, extinguishes emotionally manipulative expressions of feeling. 
The disapproving parent believes negative emotions are unproductive or a waste of time. You can feel the judgment in that one. They see negative emotions, especially sadness, as a commodity that should not be squandered, right? Like, don't be sad about this. Other people have it worse. Save it for the really tough time. I, I saw a meme one time that I love about this that says that um, telling somebody they shouldn't be sad because other people have it worse is like telling somebody they shouldn't be happy because other people have it better. Nonsense. And if we learn to, to lean into, to welcome, to empathize, to follow those steps that Gottman talks about, our children can learn to move through it. The disapproving is concerned with the child's obedience to authority. And the effects are the same as the dismissing parent. They, they think that they're wrong or crazy, lack confidence. Now the laissez-faire parent goes in, a, in another direction. The laissez-faire parent freely accepts all the emotional expressions from the child, child right? That sounds positive. Uh, they offer comfort to the child experiencing the negative feelings. They offer, a, they offer little guidance on behavior, right? They don't know how to have a discussion while still validating around problem solving and solutions. They don't teach the child about emotions, right? It's, it's hands off. It's almost like the child is left to their own devices. They're permissive and don't set limits. I think one thing that Gottman doesn't outline as specifically as I do, but this idea that you can still have a limit and children learning to deal with, who have to learn to deal with your limit, they learn frustration, tolerance, and delay of gratification. Ultimately, what Gottman is talking about is finding self and finding others, right? Being a self and showing up and showing up with a great capacity to listen to others. The lazy parent lacks their own limits. They're selfless. They don't really show up in the child's life. Does not help the child solve problems. Does not teach problem solving methods to the child. Believes there is little you can do about negative emotions other than write it out. Again, left to their own devices. Believes that managing neg negative emotions is a matter of hydraulics. Release the emotion and the work is done. The effects of laissez-faire parent, laissez -faire, faire parenting is that the ch child does not learn to relate to their emotions. They have trouble concentrating, forming relationships, and getting along with others. So let's talk about this emotion coach, this parent. They value the child's negative emotions. Like I said, it's an opportunity for intimacy. They tolerate spending time with a sad, angry, or fearful child. But they, don't, they don't become impatient with the emotion. They're aware of and value their own emotions. That's that part about becoming a self, showing up as a self. They see the world of negative emotions as an important area for parenting. One of the difficulties that we have found where two parents work and a child is in daycare is that when the child and the parent reunite in the evening, that the parent doesn't have the bandwidth to kind of go through the difficulties, right? While at daycare, because they're in a group, compliance has been overvalued. And then the child has no expression, no place to express difficult, uncomfortable, so-called negative emotions. The emotion coach is sensitive to the child's emotional state, even when they are subtle. That's something that happens for your children out here. They become sensitive to other people's emotional states. The emotion coach is not confused or anxious about the child's emotional expression. Knows what it needs, knows, knows what needs to be done. They respect the child's emotions. Doesn't poke fun or make light. I do that sometimes. My, even my youngest will call me on that. Does not poke fun or make light of the child's negative feelings. The emotional coach, the emotion coach does not say how the child should feel. That might seem obvious, but I can't tell you how many times in interactions between parent and child, between one person and another, I hear people telling others how they should feel. You shouldn't feel mad at that. You shouldn't feel scared. 
you shouldn't feel hurt. And then there's an explanation about why right after that. The emotion does not feel that he or she has to fix every problem for the child. Very important. Again, it often comes from, Gottman doesn't talk about this to this extent, but it can come from the, 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 the parent's childhood wound of not having somebody there for them. And so they overcompensate by becoming over-involved. That's why in my work, I tend to focus more on healing the parent's childhood, childhood experience, childhood wound, versus telling them what to do. The emotion coach uses emotional moments as a time to first listen to the child, empathize and offer soothing words and affection, help the child identify the feeling, offer guidance, and set limits and expressible, acceptable expressions of emotions, and then teaching problem-solving skills. The effects of having an emotion coach for a parent or caregiver is that the child learns to trust their feelings, regulate their own emotions, and solve problems. High self-esteem, learn well, get along well with others. So this is Gottman's model. And there's more to it, of course. If you're interested in this, if you like a scientific approach, this book may well appeal to you. I love in Gottman's approach how he starts off with know thyself first. But that's the foundation for being an emotional coach. Uh, listening and connecting are the key to building resilience and emotional health in a child. We know that from attachment theory. And we also know what gets in the way of healthy attachment at the outset is a parent's unresolved childhood experience. And that you get to preserve yourself. In other words, you get to show up as a self. Know your boundaries and own your reactions to your child. Gottlieb, Gottman talks a lot about parents appropriately expressing anger their, to their children. He and I might depart on that. Again, he's a scientist, I'm a practitioner. I see how parents' anger weighs on children. And the way that he explains it is, is that it's appropriately, not sarcastic, not punitive. I agree with all of that. But I think there's a finer point that there is in his work some suggestion that the parental anger is a natural consequence that the child needs to learn to, to, to solve, to respond to. So he and I might diverge there. Here's where we fundamentally diverge. He has a lab. My experience is just watching family. He brings families into this and studies them. I'm just watching families interact. He talks about the research. He's absolutely an evidence-based theorist. He teaches what his research shows, but he suggests in the way that he writes, and he does this in his other books too, he suggests that because the research tends to come out this way, that there's a guarantee. And again, I fear that that message will just be an alternative way to offer parents control. That if you do it, quote unquote, right, you'll get the outcome that you want. And that thinking, that mentality towards another human being is fundamentally flawed. I put the, the phrase alcoholic parents here on the slide because in one anecdote, he talks about a client with alcoholic parents. Like every alcoholic is the same. Like you can generalize in that way. My dissertation, one of the critiques of studying children of alcoholics was that not every alcoholic is the same. There are pleasant alcoholics. There are fall down drunk alcoholics. There are angry and abusive alcoholics. There are blackout alcoholics. There are functional alcoholics. And so again, when we start to look at quantitative research like, like Gottman does, everything is the same picture. Everything is the same thing. And again, the, the last thing is the difference between Gottman, the departure for the two of us is he gives you lists of what to do and what they prove, how they turn out, what the effects are. I, I think, though, that the easy part of this work, the hard part is what I want to. Why do I struggle when I'm giving a list of 10 things to do? Why do I struggle in a moment to do some of them? 
And if I go back and find the answer to that question, I'll, I'll have a, a better ability to sort out what gets in my way of doing what I need to do. And that's really doing what I need to do, doing the, the, the quote unquote right thing. That's the easier part of the equation. It's not, it's not unimportant. It's just not the most important part of the equation in my experience as a practitioner, as a parent educator. All right, let's, uh, we'll, we'll get to any questions. There are no current questions. We'll get to the questions here after I go through some of the announcement slides. We want all parents, all current parents to attend six 12 step meetings while their child is with us. If you haven't yet, please do it. Please try it, it's free. If nothing else, you have empathy for your child of walking into a room that, that's scary or uncomfortable. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous, we ask you to go to six meetings, any combination of those. You can also go to NAMI.org for classes and information in your area that are affordable or free. Social media, are all of these broadcasts available on the podcast app on your iPhone device or on the Android devices? They're av available on the SoundCloud app. Download that. Or you can go to a computer and go to soundcloud.com and search Evoke Therapy programs and all of those platforms. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at Evoke Therapy. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy programs. You can also find the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook and the Evoke Therapy blog for great new content. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon, also on Audible. We ask all current parents to come to a workshop. So the next one is December 8th and 9th. At our Oregon program, if you need, uh, if you have questions or you want to RSVP, talk to Melanie at evoketherapy.com. If you want to combine that with a visit to your child, talk to your child's therapist. The next intensive, if you want to do a deep dive, that that foundation that, that Gottman and I talk about with, you know, know thyself first, come to our Finding You. Our next Finding You uh, for parents, parent alumni, is January 9th through 13th in Park City, Utah at our Summit Lodge. Email intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information. Uh, parent support groups uh, coming up. I'll be in the Bay Area next December 11th uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Griffin will be there, actually. I had something come up, so Michael Griffin is Griff, as some of you know him. He'll, he'll be there. That's on a Sunday. We do them in, in, in Los Angeles on a Sunday to help with traffic. I'm from Los Angeles, and no matter what kind of traffic you think you have, my experience is LA has, has, has your beat. New York City, I'll be in New York City on January 14th. Email Melanie at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. You can go to our website and look at our pursuit trips for families, customizable anywhere in the world, any activities, recreational activities for young adults or families. All right, any live questions that have come in? Parent asks, isn't it too late to help a child in this way when they're already teenagers? Absolutely not. No, good, great question. It's not, it's not too late. I am not a teenager anymore. And what I've experienced with my therapist in the last 20 years, essentially, is this what I'm describing tonight. She serves the role of, of an emotional coach in my life, has made all the difference in the world has changed my life, has changed the work that I do, has changed my relationship with my wife, with my children. It's everything. So it's never too late. Another parent asks, I've been thinking about something you said on a previous webinar about almost being at the point that you do not want parents to tell, to share their feelings with their children. I think I understand this and it seems to relate to being an emotional coach to your child. But how do you not express your feelings when you're triggered by something your child says? That's a great question. You know, my, my answer would be, you step away, you own it. it. I'm almost to the point, and I'm glad you make that point, but it's about, it's my feeling. It's not your responsibility. You don't have to do anything about it, but I, I'm upset. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I need a timeout. Or I have to have this boundary. I'm not okay with the way you've treated my house, me, your sibling. I'm frustrated and angry. So, so it, it, you can. It, it's difficult for most people to do it without it, it, it loading on the child, without it sending the message that your feelings are your child's responsibility. 
It's hard for people to do that. And I think it takes a lot of time and practice. But you can do it by owning it, by using it in the context of boundaries you're going to set to take care of yourself, your, your home, the other family members in your home. You can do it. It's just look out for the idea that you're modeling and suggesting implicitly to your child that your feelings are their responsibility. Therefore, they go out in the world believing that what people think about them, including those peers, that peer group that you don't like, that, that partner that you don't like, that what that, those people think about them is about them because they can't distinguish. So you can. It just takes a lot of progress and evolution, a lot of, process, a lot of, uh, a lot of evolution in the process. All right, looks like those are all the questions for right now. I'm going to be talking specifically about low frustration tolerance next Monday, December 10th, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Please join us then. Again, thank you for and on behalf of your children for joining us. Thank you for being willing to step into this work and for your practice. Um, it makes all the difference. Show up as a, a project in your child's life and watch them over time open up to their own project, their own work, their own wounds, their own vulnerability. Thanks, folks. Have a great weekend. I'll talk to you next Monday night. Take care. Bye-bye.